So yes, I wanted to talk to you this evening about breaking the cycle of addiction. And that's a strange title for um, a church group, isn't it? Isn't it? I do want some feedback. So wherever you are, whether you're on YouTube, I'm, I've got my um, YouTube list here and I can see everyone. So if you want to post in the chat, please do so too. Why do we need to talk about addiction? And as we go through the presentation this evening, these some things will be, you will know them already because nothing I'm going to share is exactly new. So let's just bow our heads and Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, because you are such a loving and gracious God. You've given us more than we could ever hope for. And we ask, Father, that wherever we are, whatever state we're in, that you will help us to be thankful. And right now, we ask that your words will be the words that people will hear and the message, whether it's a little piece or a big chunk of this message, people will walk away having learned something that's going to bring them closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to start by thinking about um, if I were given some money, for example, for the number of sermons that you've listened to, how rich would you be? Yeah, if I were given money for the number of sermons I've listened to, the number of prayer meetings that I've attended, the number of different types of advice that I've received from different sources, or the number of times when that still small voice whispered something to me, really important to me over the years. Would we be rich if we counted the number of times that those things have happened, we would, wouldn't we? But what if we collected money for the times when we heeded or didn't heed that advice? Would, we, would that be equal, you think? How many times have we disobeyed, not listened? I think the first question, we probably would be able to have a small mention with that. But the numbers of times that we've heeded advice and warning um, would be less. So let's think this through. It took the children of Israel 40 years to complete a few hundred miles journey. Why was that? A few hundred miles journey took them 40 years. Why did it take them 40 years? I think it was something like 220 to 250 miles, but they had to go around it so many times. And maybe when we come further down into this presentation, we'll understand it. As Christians, we are not expected to just be still. We often hear that, don't we? Be still. But when we're still, sometimes that's not exercising faith because faith and works go together. So we've got to think about that carefully. What does being still mean? Um, I, I said to you earlier on that I'm, I'm very anxious, I'm very nervous tonight. It's unusual for me, but there are lots of things that are happening. We as Christians have to continuously be practicing what we're reading, what we're preaching. So if we receive some new light tonight, what should we do with it? We listen to it or shut our ears off or what do we do? Do we come back to, to it and think about how can I put that piece of practice into my, my life? Every one of us would say that we long to be closer to God. Um, and, and it's true, we really want to follow him wherever he may lead us. Is that, am I right there? Yes. We sing about it. We hear, I will follow thee, my saviour, wheresoe'er thou leadest me, where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I follow thee. We sing this song, we sing this allegiance, but do we do it? And that's a question for each of us to answer in our quiet, reflective moments. So where am I going with this? Um, so yes, we call ourselves Christians. We're striving to be more Christ-like. But some of us, some of us, including myself, are in a rut. And we've been in a rut for a long time. We may have been in church many years, yet we remain spiritually stagnant. 
and why might that be? And I would want to say to us tonight, it's because we have addictions that keep us trapped. Um, so what, what does that mean? Think about an addiction. What is an addiction? Normally, an addiction is something associated with drugs and alcohol, gambling, pornography, sex. There's a whole list of things that um, could come under addiction. Why would Christians have addictions? Addictions can be good or bad, can't they? Am I right? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, yes. In a way. In a way. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Godfrey and, and, and Sister Karina. So addictions can be good or bad habits. So if you're learning your Bible every day, or you're practicing what God, that's a good habit, and that's what we need more of. So we're stuck in these ruts. And we need to think about why are we stuck in these ruts. So an addiction is when we become dependent on something or someone. And I'm going to say to you tonight that sin is an addiction. Yeah? And that sin is an addiction. Addiction equals sin. And so we have to think about the, this in a, in a perhaps a different way. Addictions, just like alcohol, um, addictions to drug or alcohol, a sin addiction has side effects. And we all, when we, we're coming off uh, away from sin, when we've given our life to Christ, we may have withdrawal symptoms. So we want to think about sin in this context tonight. So from an outside perspective, someone with an addiction looks like they're repeatedly making bad choices and ignoring reason. However, the truth about addiction is far more complicated, so much so that it can be very difficult to overcome a substance use disorder without help or treatment. This is partly due to the negative feedback loop that occurs in our mind. So, the devil keeps us in that loop of negativity. Sin keeps us trapped. We become prisoners to sin. And so we have to think about how can we change this? Now, we, we don't often apply um, theoretical perspectives about addiction and how to overcome to sin. We don't, because we think that those with a drug addiction is far worse, but actually we're all there. If we're committing sin, we're all there. Um, so when someone is addicted to drugs or alcohol, they get a sense of comfort they haven't been able to get elsewhere. And so the same thing happens when we are addicted to some of the sins that we've had in our lives. Um, and then when we try to move away from it, the, the way that, we, that, that negative loop, feedback loop happens is that we we feel guilty because of what we've done. We feel ashamed. And it's difficult for us to, to, to face that. Sometimes it's difficult for us to face the consequences of our actions. But the weight of these feelings force us to seek comfort in doing the thing again. Does that make sense? Yeah? You know, when we look at the children of Israel, and they were going through the wilderness, and God was feeding them manna, trying mm -hmm. to get them to be addicted to manna. Mm -hmm. But they cursed the manna and saying, we want flesh. Mm -hmm. And so long they were in the wilderness, and they still had that addiction Mm -hmm. in them to eat flesh and we at the spiritual Israel have to watch it because the addiction that we have before we come to Christ doesn't leave us God give us grace so that we won't run after it mm -hmm. and we love him more than the addiction if we love the addiction of flesh or whatever it may be more than God, 
no matter how long we go into church, that is what we're going to long after. Brother Godfrey, can you stop stealing my, my message? <laughs> <laughs> I have your notes right in front of me. Thank you. Yeah, so you're absolutely right there. And, you know, addiction keep people dependent because it's got the physical effects. The, the cravings, psychologically, it's, it's making us long for it. Therefore, it affects our motivation, it affects our moods, it affects our emotions, and it even affects our health. So a sin addiction can have a similar impact, except we don't treat sin as an addiction, do we? So sin, I would say, is an addiction, and we need to be very careful about how we manage or try to change patterns. So like any other addiction, um, you know, sometimes, not always, but sin starts in the mind, doesn't it? Before you've even done the deed, if you thought it, it's a sin. So it happens before it becomes an action. Repeated sin is called a habit. A habit can therefore be classified as an addiction. So we're all born with choices and we get to decide whether we want to use our choices for good or for bad. Our ability to make wise choices is developed. It doesn't just happen. We have to learn. And that's what we're talking about, the mountain. So we heard that song, sometimes it takes a mountain. God gives us these experiences to help us, to draw us closer to him. We learn to sacrifice and to obey. And when we learn to sacrifice and obey, it strengthens our potential to make better choices. Choices must always glorify God. And in doing so, we will also benefit from his blessings. The more we obey, the stronger we become in our ability to be more Christ-like. In that we're growing to be obedient, committed, holy, and sanctified. What we need to remember here is that Christ has already died for our sins. And therefore, we need do nothing else except confess when we do something wrong and he is able and just to forgive us. But like Paul, there are times when we, we, we do the very opposite of what we really want to do. Now, some of us, and I'll speak about that in a moment, when we are addicted to sin, we give the devil permission to keep us chained and locked. And sometimes we're in denial. Sometimes we know exactly what we're doing, but we need some support and help to get out of that situation. And this repeat cycle, the more you get into the sin, the more you feel guilty. And Satan does a good job of making us feel that, there's, you know, we're not good enough. God doesn't really want us. God's not really going to save, you, save us. We are worthless. And these are the thoughts that keep us locked in a cycle. And so we become stuck. Yeah. So let's think about it a little bit more. So the spiritual versus the flesh. So why does this happen? Romans 7, 15 to 25. Can anybody see, read my screen and just read those verses for me? The spiritual versus the flesh. There's a conflict going on here. Yep. I'm, I'm, I am not able to do the things I want. And at the same time, I do the things I despise. If I'm doing the things I've already decided not to do, I'm agreeing with the law regarding what is good. I've lost control. Sin has taken up residence in me and is wrecking havoc. I know that in me, that is in my fallen human nature, there is nothing good. I can will myself to do something good, but that does not help me carry it out. I can determine that I'm going to do good, but I don't do it. Instead, I end up living out the evil that I decided not to do. Yeah, so what, what is this all about? So as I said, we're all born with choices. We get to use those choices for good or for bad. And so we have to understand the difference between our, our nature and God's nature. Now, if Christ is living in us, we will not sin. Yes, we might fall sometimes, but we pick ourselves up and go again. 
but we have to learn to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 18 says that if we're walking in the spirit, we can only do good things. But there's this conflict between the sinful nature versus the spiritual self. And it's a battle that's going to be there until the day we die. Satan wants you. Not for anything good. But we talk about that conflict between the heart and the head. The heart says, the, the head knows what to do, but the heart is emotional. It, it wants to do the opposite sometimes. And we need to bring all of that into control. So if we're acting in, if those in the flesh cannot please God, so what it says is carnal mind is enmity against God. Those in the flesh cannot please God. If you act in, the sinful, in your sinful nature, you cannot please God. If the spirit of God dwells in you, you cannot sin. If Christ is in you, the body is dead to sin. We are all um, capable of, of making a change. But we've got to think about what that change might look like um, and how we go about making that change. So Romans 8 says, the mind is governed by the, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit easily to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But we don't leave it there, do we? Because God is saying something to us. He's saying, I came to take you out of yourselves to break these chains yeah so when paul is saying i can't do anything the last verse if you look at verse 25 under my text it said i am thankful to god for the freedom that comes through our lord jesus the anointed one so on the one hand i devotedly serve god's law with my mind but on the other hand with my flesh i serve the principle of sin so you see the battle that's happening here? Is that battle easy for us to win? Can we do it on our own, for example? Can we fight this um, battle that is raging? Yeah. Why do I keep repeating the same sins over and over when I want to do what's right, but I cannot seem to do it? Why do I keep doing it? What we need to understand is that sin isn't new. Satan has a million and one ways to entrap us. Yep, your head knows what is right, but your heart desires something else. Satan has millions of ways to trap us and keep us locked in old cycles, slaves to sin. But we must understand that we can break that. But for it to become a reality, we have to do, we have to action it. We must recognize that your human heart is sinful above all else. But through Christ, we, we can overcome. So just a few people who, who had, sorry, Brother, Brother Godfrey, you were going to say something. Yes. Um, when we look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 3. Jesus said he would put enmity. That enmity that God gave us is to overpower the power of sin so that we, we can choose to or not to. And if we have that enmity, when we go along in Ezekiel, the Lord said he will give us a new heart. He will put, take away our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. And lower down, he said, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and my judgment. And so once we have that new heart, of course, sin our sinful habits that we had before we come to God, we still, Satan will still try to overcome us with those sins. 
but because of the enmity and the love we have for God, we can turn away. If we have not turned away, it's because we want to do it. And you know, sin is a, like you said, sin is a very unexplained desire of knowing something that is wrong and still desiring to do it. That's why Paul said he needed Jesus because he couldn't do it on his own. We, we try to fight sin on our own, but we can't do it. So we look at somebody like David. Um, would you say David was a serial, um, a serial sinner? I will say for the position that God put David in and the high office that he had and to show the deceivableness of sin. David was sinning. He didn't realize at the time when he was sinning that he was sinning. But he was sinning. He didn't, he was, he was, he, the plan, the plan, the pre premeditated plan that David set up to, to get another man's wife, David was blind to it at the time when he was doing it until Nathan pointed it out to him. It shows the, the deceivableness of sin. I want to say something about that, is that sometimes a sin, sin doesn't just happen. It creeps up on us. So David's lust, just think of where he's saying, if David is lusting, it means that he, whatever he's lusting after becomes his idol. So if he's breaking that commandment about wanting what your neighbor has, he's breaking the, the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Yeah. And so we've got to think about sin like that. But David did sin and it did start somewhere and he should have recognized it because God said that David was a man after his own heart. Um, and why was that? Because David did confess. And when he confronted with his sin, he did confront, confess and he dealt with it. But it doesn't mean that the consequences of it are, are gone. Abraham, he also committed sin, didn't he? So, you know, he lied to get himself out of a situation which God could easily have got him out of. And his problem was that he didn't trust God enough. And so we need to learn to trust God when we are in situations. We don't have to sin. We just need to put our trust in God. Jacob was a thief and a liar. Don't think about that. All of these people were used. Moses, anger was his sin. And not just on one occasion, it stopped him from getting into the promised land. So we have to think of our sins and what, what is it restricting us from? Sodom and Gomorrah, they, there was no hope for them. But we could be in the same position as Sodom and Gomorrah if we keep on ignoring our own condition. Um, so giving ourselves to God is not, um, it is not something to think about. It is a priority. We have to do that. So is there hope for us? And I would hear, I'd probably hear all of you say, yes, there is hope. Yeah, God wants to free us from our sin addictions. And if we adapt the fruits of the spirit, the last part of that, if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the, or let us also walk in the, the spirit. If the spirit is living in us and we're walking in the spirit, God will keep us from sinning. And James 17 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But you have to get stronger. Yeah, it's not easy. We can't play with it. It, it is something that's going to affect us if we play with it because the devil has had years of, of, of dealing with this. So to break the cycle of sin, we have to... Um, think about getting rid of the old habits and putting new habits in its place. So wherever you might have got up and run out of the house and you didn't say a prayer this morning, you might have to replace that with something else that's going to help you to break that old cycle. All right? So old habits, they say they die hard. 
but it's not impossible. And I think we, we need to think about that for ourselves. One of the things that we tend to do when we are um, addicted is to make excuses, don't we? Yeah, we make excuses. And, and when it comes to sin, we need to stop making excuses. We have to take responsibility for our, our, ex, for our actions. You know, think about sin keeps us dependent because we get something from it. We're choosing it. We're actively choosing sin. And we need to reflect on how we can stay out of addiction and stop making those excuses. Excuses keep us trapped. Yeah. So we blame others, we hide, we lie, we rationalize our addictive behaviors. We continue to, to do the thing despite the consequences. We minimize the consequences of addiction. And all of that serves to keep us trapped um, in the cycle. So I want us to think about how we, you know, understand why we do what we do. Why do people give up everything for a life of sin? And I want you to kind of take these texts away with you. We need to acknowledge that we have an addiction and we need to confess and seek forgiveness for this. We need to think actively about why we do, the motivation for doing what we're doing. Um, and we need to want to change. But that change, all of us have a desire to seek God. That change doesn't just happen. We have to feed it and nurture it. We have to become aware of our triggers. So just like somebody with an addiction, we become aware of things that trigger us and we avoid it. So if you're an alcoholic, you don't go to the pub, do you? You don't go to the bar. You don't have a sip of alcohol. You might just have an orange juice or something because you know you cannot take it. We cannot take a little bit of sin. We've got to give up everything. So the understanding of why we do what we do helps us to avoid future lapses. And some of the things how, that we can do to overcome is to understand, yeah, the Bible is there for us. It's full of wisdom. It's full of ways to help us out of this. It, the sin isn't new. And to recognize that God has a plan for every single one of us. But we must recognize our responsibility. The more time we spend reading the Bible, the more we adapt and learn new actions, it will help us to resist. So some of us may need to dust off our Bibles and begin to read it every day. We have to be prayerful and selfish with that time that we give to God. We might want to think about finding others we trust who can support us. It's interesting that you might find that there are other people in our little community who are experiencing the exact same problem. And we should um, talk to them. The Bible says we should confess our sins one to another. I know that some people may not want to do that because they don't trust people. But you've got to give people an opportunity, and that might mean opening up to new people, trusting God to lead you to the right person where you can share your, your, your situation without feeling it's going to end up everywhere else. So thinking Jesus is the only example that we need to follow. The Revelations 3.21 tells us Jesus already overcame and he sat and at down with his father on his throne. So if Jesus overcame, so can we. So look to Jesus as your forerunner and great example, and look at how he did it, because it can happen. But I just want to share something with you. Um, the cycle of change is a, a perspective that people use to help them to think about where they are in their cycle of change. And I think we need, as Christians, we need to think more seriously about the, 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 the rut that we're in, why we're in that same place. So if you look at number one, can you see what it says? So pre-contemplation. So pre-contemplation is the first day. When you want to break a cycle, that's the first stage. Um, this is perhaps you're not quite fully there. You're, you're not yet considering whether or not to make this change. You may not be, uh, or, or you may be thinking, are you able to make the change? 
But at this stage, what you're doing is raising awareness within yourself. As you become exposed more to the Bible, as you become exposed more to people who will kind of just impact you and, and, and raise something within you, then you begin to think about, I need to make a change. And so I started off by saying, if I were given money for the amount of sermons I listen to, I would be rich. But the amount of times that I do what they tell me, I would lose money there. So we're raising awareness, which is what sermons do. They raise our awareness for something, and then it's for us to take it away. Then at stage two, we're contemplating. Yeah, We see that change is possible. Maybe other people are encouraging you, but we're still uncertain. So we start to think about help in to choose change. What can I do? Who can I turn to? Where can I go to get my, my help, help me to make this change? Then I go into stage three, which is determination. You, you, you're moving beyond now. You're not just contemplating. You are determined that you want to make that change. You're committed to the change. And so you have to think about the strategies that you need to help you. So sin doesn't go by just thinking it's going it's to go. You have to put something into action. So think about the strategies. Strategies are not just for, for CEOs. It's not just for companies. Strategies are for us. They're plans to help us to remain out of trouble. And then at the action stage, yes? So we're taking those positive steps towards change. We're not yet stable, so we're on our little bicycles. We've got our stabilizers, and we are thinking about um, staying on that bicycle. So we still need help to implement change strategies. So we might think about changing the company that we're in, for example, because that's going to be a strategy that will help us to stay away from certain types of sin. And we are learning to, to stop any potential relapses. So that's in the action stage. But then we're moving on, so you're getting stronger and stronger. By the time you get to stage five, it's the maintenance stage. You're achieving your goal. You're feeling positive. You've got new skills, and you're on your way to recovery from um, addiction. You hit stage six, and something happens. Somebody says something to you that brings you back to a place where the memories of that can make you relapse. So... A problem occurs, you relapse, you have to cope with the consequences and you determine, you decide, what do I need to do next? So that is at the, the reoccurrence stage. Many of us stop at that reoccurrence stage and we think, failed once, so I'm not going to go and do it again. But this cycle is to continually go around it. So we go back to pre-contemplation, we build our strength, we start to go back around the cycle and the more times we go around the cycle, the stronger we will become. But if we just stay where we are to in stage six, thinking it's too hard, I can't do it, we have failed. And then Christ has died for nothing. So I think if we use these kind of little tips to help us to think about the stages, um, it will help us to, to stay focused. And finally, I want us to think about the... The fact that Jesus heals addictions, this is his, his thing. So like the woman with the issue of blood, we can reach and touch his garment and he can, he will set us free. The absence of sin is called perfection, but it comes with losses. And we've got to kind of recognize that if you want to be holding Christ, we have to let go. We have to suffer the losses. We have to take up Christ's cross. And we must tackle whatever it is that's keeping us from experiencing the fullness of God throughout. So to be overcomers, what do we need to do? What do we need to do first? Die to self daily. Yeah, and be intentional. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And be strong. Be strong. Very good. We set goals. We don't just leave it. You know, Satan is coming for us as believers. But if we put on the whole armor of God, 
he will support us. Remember, resist the devil and he will flee from us. We see the consequences of sin all around us every day. A really important part of all of this is the planning, the evaluating, the reviewing, the reflecting on what we're doing. We need to spend time in prayerful um, um, devotion with God. It's not just a thought that we think about in our head. It's much more serious than that. Yeah, um, We can be conquerors because Christ has made it possible for us. And just remember that none of us are perfect. So as we look at each other around the church, you might think some people look more perfect than others, but the truth will be told when we get to heaven. Yeah, we don't look at anybody else. Let's look at Christ because he is the example that we need. Don't let other people make us feel you can't do it because the devil is going to constantly give you that message. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Tell yourself you can do it. You will do it. And you must do it. I can do it. I will do it. And I must do it. So, um, I think tonight what we need to do is just to lay our conditions at Jesus' feet and ask him to take control of the things that we cannot manage. Help him to lead, guide and direct us to overcome sin on our addictions. And one of the most, one of the most important thing in our Christian walk is to save souls. Find something to do to win souls for Jesus. It have many, we have many different areas in the church mm -hmm. where one can work towards helping one else to get to know Jesus. And mm -hmm. in getting to know Jesus, in helping someone to get to know Jesus, we will see miracles that will help us and will encourage us to love Jesus more than our desires. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, folks, that we're all on this journey together and there are times when we are going to fail, we are going to commit sin. Um, but as I said earlier on, let's just be committed to not give up on ourselves. Because when we overcome, it might help somebody else who's struggling. And we won't even know sometimes who we have touched because we are fighting this this is happening. Let's just pray. Father, there are times when we are overwhelmed by the desires that we have in our hearts which do not come from you. Sometimes we, we, we choose, we make choices very quickly without thinking about the consequences. We allow the devil to manipulate and to take control of our choices. But we want to be overcomers and we want to commit ourselves to you. We want to follow you all the way, to be obedient, to do whatever it is that you, we need to do to make it to heaven. We thank you because you, it is impossible for you to fail us. So where we have failed, we want to put those failures at your feet. We want to present ourselves. We want to um, commit, use our bodies as a house for you. So help us to put it right. Help us to support one another in whatever problem or addictions that we may all have. Help us not to be judgmental towards any one person. Help us not to be ashamed of what we have done in the past. But Lord, open our hearts to see our potential through you. May you forgive us and may you guide, guard and protect us. From here on, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.